Hello and uh, welcome to our Meet Discovery Network's international session. Dee and I will uh, call you from here on in. Now, some people have been asking um, why we're holding this session. It hasn't had a, a session with Discovery like this before, but as you'll be aware, the channel is evolving, or the family of channels, I should say, really has grown and changed, well, so much in recent years, and of course it's changing as we speak. It's time we thought we'd take a detailed look at what's happening with those channels and also give that platform we're trying to do uh, throughout the, the days we're in Edinburgh for production companies to find out a bit more about the way they're thinking when it comes to commissioning. Plus, of course, last night's McTaggart and uh, the, uh, the comments of uh, Mr. Abrahams, which uh, I see you smiling there, Lee. Okay, we'll be dealing with that very, very shortly. So let me introduce our panel. We are joined by Lee Bartlett. Very glad to have him here. Executive Vice President, Global Production Management Business and Legal Affairs, formerly from IT and Fox and based in LA, uh, from where he has flown in pretty recently. So thanks for dealing with the with the uh, with the uh, jet lag and the sleep deprivation. And executive, sorry, executive president, isn't it? Not vice president. Excuse me. Uh, sorry, my mistake. Yeah. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Lee, that, that'll do. Uh, Sarah Thornton beside me here, vice president for production and development, factual entertainment. That's the commissioning editor, essentially. What for? Lifestyle and entertainment. It's yeah. our female okay. entertainment channels, largely TLC. Okay, well, we're going. To, that's that's a nice uh, division. That's uh, that's how we're going to be uh, discussing things as uh, as the session developments beca uh, develops because we've got Liz McIntyre there, Vice President Production and Development Factual for Discovery Networks International. Nice big title there, and so that's Commissioning Editor for Factual Programs broadly. broadly. Yes. So you do the blokes. Fa I, I do the blokes. Um, okay. Factual and specialist <laughs> factual. Yes. Okay, and you also and, and we're also going to be discussing just the. The, the scale of your reach, the, the areas you uh, commission for. So you've got what, Western Europe, Central Europe and, and, the, and the Middle East. I mean, it's... The, the easiest is to see it as um, all of the world apart from the US, sometimes with the US um, buying in. That's the easiest way of seeing okay, it. Okay, so just yeah. a few billion people there yeah. then, that's n nice and small. <laughs> um, and just to remind you, as you know by now, these sessions, that it's, it's interactive. Um, the app, which I hope you've all downloaded by this stage, on the uh, on the uh, uh, laptops, on the tablets, on the on the iPad, to get questions to any of our panelists, um, go to the, uh, the, uh, the the Lee picture, the Lee Bartlett picture, and give that a prod, and then you can put your <laughs> yeah. I know it sounds great, doesn't it? Yeah. And then then you can put in questions. As you know, there are already some people who've uh, furnished questions, so you can like those, and that will push it up towards the top and make it more likely to be asked or you can just put in your own and that will come up as the latest. It's slightly different uh, once more if you're just doing this on a, on a smartphone. On the app, the, uh, the controller button is down in the far right. I'm sure you'll all work it out. So to kick it off, um, Discovery uh, DNI have uh, supplied us with, uh, with a sizzle reel. Let's see if it sizzles. Should we have a look? Give us some sense. Shows you can put together a sizzle tape, I suppose. <laughs> Is it Lee? We're, we've got to start with you. I, I mean, how do you keep across it all? It's an amazing portfolio help. of channels. I mean, is it all as bright and shiny as it seems in a, a 90 second tape? Um, yes, yes, and no. I mean, you do have to create the program to make it to the, to the tape. And for every program you see on the tape, there's three or four um, that didn't make it to the tape. Um, the interesting thing about uh, running the production management and, and business side of Discovery is that it uses every side of your brain. So you can be talking about a US problem on Monday, a Polish problem on Tuesday, a, a Chinese problem on Wednesday. So um, you, you learn to see where these problems uh, or opportunities too are interrelated and it makes, um, you know, fortunately with enough people working for you, but it, it never gets boring, which is an unusual thing to, to say about a job. And it's described as a family of, of channels. I mean, is it, what kind of family is it? Is it dysfunctional sometimes? It's a dysfunctional family. I mean, everybody, I don't know of any family that's not dysfunctional at some time. I mean, you can fight amongst, amongst members of your family, but as soon as someone attacks you from the outside, you have a united front. It just is, is I think, a, a visceral response to, um, um, to things. But it, it's interesting because the things that, that get um, argued over, you know, are usually things dealing with content and creativity. Um, and it's trying to come up with the best program that we possibly can. 
and the, the jobs that uh, my coworkers have are, are close to impossible because you're trying to create a, a hit that is global in the beginning. It's completely different than, than most situations where you create a hit in one country and then you try and either sell the finished episodes or the formats in another. Here, you're trying to hit the whole world at the same time. Mm. And the record of success that they have at doing that is greater than the record of success I think most networks have on just trying to create a program for one country. Well, let's talk, I mean, I've got to put this to you. You talked about the family being attacked from the outside. Well, that happened last night, didn't it? I, I woke up this morning, I opened up my paper, and there's, um, I mean, we heard the McTaggart last night, but there's the headline, profit-hungry US giants set to gobble up British TV industry. You must have been reading that. What do you think? I mean, you're- Oh, well, we're well, not you know, finished. You're, you're, you know, <laughs> it's just begun. I mean, I was at the McTaggart lecture, and it was, I'm, I'm glad to know that I'm related somewhat to Darth Vader. Um, <laughs> You know, and also that the only thing that we were interested in was making money. and Profit before creativity. Profit before creativity. Although I don't know how you make a profit if you don't have, a cre if you don't have good creativity. So to me, David had it backwards because if you create a good program, you will make money. If you don't create a good program, you won't make money. Um, I can speak from the, from the discovery point of view. The first acquisition that we made ever in our history was uh, three years ago with Betty, which was a very small production company. Um, and I was fortunate um, to have spent a number of years at, uh, at ITV, so I had a good understanding of who was who within the creative community and who you know, I personally felt was good and that everybody here felt was good. So. Um, we, we bought them for a couple of, of reasons, um, and this carries through all the way through to the all three media transaction. Um, it's finding people that are creative and giving them better tools than they have now. So what I mean by that is um, if they have an idea of expanding, they want to open an office in the United States, or they want to open an office in uh, Australia, we can make that happen. Um, the way in which you know, I have been very careful is that you don't bring them in to your company. You are there to support them. You are there to help them through difficult times. You're there to finance their crazy ideas, but you leave them alone. Because I don't believe that having a bunch of people within the company can create everything that the company needs. Okay, well that's, I mean, but you know, let's talk about the profits because, you know, David Abraham's point, you rather threw it away, David Abraham's point isn't given the, the unique configuration of Channel 4. It tries to make profits, and if it does make profits, it plows them back into creativity. You're making a slightly different point. You're saying you won't make profits unless you're creative. But those profits go to, go to shareholders, go to stakeholders, go to all kinds of different people. Well, um, there's two things to keep in mind there. First of all, in comparison to the main business of Discovery, um, the profits, quote unquote, whatever that is, that a production company makes or its margin of, say, 15%, is very small to us. So if we were buying it for profits or we were buying it for turnover, that's why we bought SBS, that's why we bought Eurosport. It's a different proposition here because profit is, it comes in many forms. And the form that I like to look at it is um, one of the first shows that Betty, uh, Betty created is now airing in, the format is airing in four different countries on our air. And the profit to us is having had the opportunity to get that show it works in another, it works on our networks, which means that helps in our affiliate negotiations and advertisers because of the nature of the program. But, but, want to I mean, come you know, into the, you know, it's the, a different, but, yeah, it's but, a different kind of And they're of different profit. sizes, and, they, and you know, some of them are more, well, they're not niche, but some of them are you know, more specialist than others. What about all three media? I mean, what about the bigger ones? They're going to make, they're going to increase your revenues. They're, that's why you're doing it, isn't it? As well. Well, actually, all three doesn't because huh. it's a 50-50 joint venture, so it is not consolidated in your uh, 50-50 with? 50-50 with Darth. Darth, Liberty, yes. John Malone. Liberty. John Malone, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it, so so that again was 
bought to be able to help them grow and to give them a better idea of what Discovery is looking for for programming for itself and hopefully what um, Virgin Media is looking for as well. We look at it as we can add value by allowing them to continue to produce for everybody else and then expand by producing but do more they, for I mean, us. Just last question on this, sure. because you know, I want to get into it. I mean, do they get preferential treatment? Do they get, will they get a, a nod and a wink from some of your commissioners uh, here no, saying, well, well I, you know, I, no. we, we own you? No, the, the, ans the answer to that is no. And uh, to me, as soon as you give somebody preferential access or you give them a series commitment, there's a natural tendency on the part of the commissioner to be slightly resentful of that because they have to commission from somebody. And the second thing is, is it makes the program creators or the creative people a bit lazy because they already know that they have a commission. So I, I, personally, don't I, I personally don't believe in that and that does not exist in our deals. So can we have it from your lips, Lee? You know, this charge, the overall charge from David Abrahams, that British creativity, the, the talent that's been developed here over, over decades, the, the internationally famous talent, which is a, attracting all these big companies in, that is safe. Because, you know, let's just, let's just revisit the, the, the quotation. Channel 5 takes its orders from Viacom in New York. Liberty and other US shareholders are trying to play footy with ITV, which could eventually put Britain's largest commercial channels in the hands of Dr. John Malone, resident of Colorado, who now controls the UK's pay cable platform, Virgin Media, our largest producer, all three, and discovery and, uh, in the, and then he goes on to call him Darth Vader, called Darth Vader by Al Gore, currently holds a net debt of 41 billion pounds and famously hates to pay tax. But you know, the, the, the charge there is British creativity, British talent safe in discovery's hands. Well, unless we physically remove the talent from Britain, um, you know, or tell them to quit creating, um, it's really hard for me to, to, to buy into that idea. I think that that's the ass backwards way of looking at it. Mm. The way I would look at it is that you're injecting capital, you're injecting additional ideas into an already vibrant um, British creative community. Mm. So I, I think... Could you, could you be expanding it? I mean, could you go the other way and say, hey, David, you got it completely ass backwards. We're putting money in. Yes, I, I mean, I think so. And British companies buy American companies all the time, and uh, you know, I just have trouble, you know, personally and professionally with the argument that this is necessarily uh, a negative. And I'll, I'll just give you one short story from one of the other um, unfortunate indies that was acquired by a big bad American, um, and that was um, it's a conversation I had yesterday, and they were complaining that the American parent company was mad at their not mad, but just we'll use mad at the uh, British production company because they were more concerned with profitability rather than taking risks on creating new programs, which to me puts David's argument on its heels. <laughs> Cuts both ways. Okay, well listen, let's get into uh, some more of the, of the, uh, the programming and uh, decide where we, whether you want more of uh, what we're gonna see or something different. And we've, we've got those mixes that you've seen in presumably in some of the other, the other sessions, things they're proud about, things uh, that uh, you know, were uh, wondering what you were thinking at the time and things for the future. So we'll start with, uh, as we usually do now, with, uh, with a, with a so-called channel defining clip. Uh, and this is from Discovery and it's marooned with Ed Stafford. Um, it's <laughs> you can see we don't spend money on talent per diems, so that's uh, very key. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's a regular lunch, is it, round at uh, DNI headquarters. Now, well, we talked about the, 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 the gender split in commissioning, so obviously a bloke eating a rat, that's down to you then, Liz. So what was, uh, tell me why you're so proud of that. Yeah, um, well, just to take a step back before we um, talk about Ed Stafford, I was just going to explain a tiny bit about our production and development group. We're an original content group, um, that uh, supply, commission, develops, commissions and supplies content for Discovery Networks International, which is all of the world apart from US, although sometimes, often, we will have US buy-in. Um, and it's your content that we're commissioning, and that will play in 220 countries around the world um, and will be translated into 45 languages. Um, and that model is proving very successful. 
In terms of um, the sorts of buckets we're looking for, um, they are broadly character-led and process-driven formats. Okay. And in terms of ed being channel-defining, this is all about people doing, finding talent that we put a little skin over to show entering their worlds of showing what they're doing anyway. So Ed is already passionate about filming himself, being by himself, and um, going as far as he can in terms of adventure and survival. So we capture that and go into his world. What is key is he is, he is showing us um, how to survive and how to thrive in extreme environments. But rather than solely the kind of rugged, square-jawed man approach, which, of course, he is very manly in himself. Um, Just but, a bit. Um, additional, additional to that, which is really important, as well as the practical um, and adventure and survival problem solving, he also does emotional problem solving. <coughs> so he thinks about his place in the world. He thinks about how to make his world bigger. He philosophizes and shows his, wears his heart on his sleeve, which is a really important combination for our male school talent particularly mm. these days. I mean, just the thought occurs, you know, we, we, you know we've been throwing out the, the, the territories, the numbers of people you're commissioning for. How big is your team? Um, we're, a, we're a boutique team, um, but uh, the key thing is, is, is that Sarah and I are go-to people in London for, to, to, to be go-to people for producers. So we are a very efficient small team, but we want as many uh, UK producers to come to us. So that's about the outreach rather than the size of our internal team. I see, team. you know how to disseminate yeah. it around, around. We do a lot of developing with um, UK producers. And in fact, in the, this last uh, year, we have increased the number of um, mm. producers that we're working with from the UK. I, I, from I want to talk more about, yeah. obviously, about um, just how important the UK is when it comes to the commissioning and the number, the, also the number of commissioners you have. But I think we want to bring in, I, th I think we want to bring in Sarah now on the on, on, on the female skewing side, but let's start with your let's start with your channel uh, defining clip. And this is well, you can introduce this bit for us. It's what have I got? Isn't it? It's a series called What Have I Got? Although in the UK, I believe we'll call it What the Hell Have I Got? Um, it's produced by Optimum. It hasn't aired yet. We're incredibly proud of it. I'd say um, it's a it's a quite a genre bending health format in that it's a kind of play along self-diagnosis show. The clip's a bit of fun actually, it doesn't really speak to the format itself, but I'll let you have a look. All right, let's have a look at it first. <laughs> Can you tell us? Or do we have to watch? Oh, you have or, to or watch Oh, dare we it. watch? You must watch it. Okay. That's the what have I, what's up my bum segment from what have I got. Right. Um, Is there a segment? Oh, it's in every episode, okay. yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of x-rays around. Is, is there a possibility of a celebrity one of those? <laughs> Because I don't know, we'd have to ask yeah, some well, of the talent circulating yeah, Edinburgh. Well, they, yeah, okay. There's a few, <laughs> few, few people I'd like to nominate. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, having, having no risk. But, you know, that's not, that's not, you know, look at that's not just female skewed, is it? No, so I think um, health is a massively important part of what we commission for our female channels. But I think one of the things that's important to remember about the female channels at Discovery when you're bringing ideas to us is that we really look for shows that have universal themes. And I'm not telling anything new to the people in this room because what UK producer isn't trying to create content that's going to travel. But one of the things we've found with health is that it's really about body image and um, uh, you know, the kind of human body and how we all relate to that. But the way we're packaging it now is very different to when we started. Mm. We started with transformation shows, which everyone's familiar with, and we're now looking at blending the genre. So we've got a couple of returners. We've got three returning series that are great, but the new ones I'm really excited about. We've got What Have I Got, which blends kind of game show, diagnosis, clip show, and it's very humorous. I don't think it's female in tone. I think it's very broad and entertaining. We've also got a... Um, medical dating show that I can't tell anyone about, but let's just say, if you think you've had a bad date, you've seen nothing yet. Um, and we're really playing with the genre. I think there's an assumption about what women want sometimes before people come into us with ideas. And I'd sort of ask people to rip that up. I think, you know, having sat at Discovery for four years and really thought about it and looked at what works around the world, what women want is good stories. And we may not be interested in discovering new territories, but we're interested in discovering what makes us all tick. And I think that's the thing that's really important for me when people are kind of trying to work out what to bring us. Beauty of the app here, Sarah, just uh, some of, they're all, oh, they're no. all anonymous. But, um, you know, but no, just as you're talking there about the opportunities and what you're looking for, and it's very interesting hearing that. But you know, just a very basic 
sensible question. How realistic is it, though, for a small UK indie and a small UK indie to land, stroke, be trusted with a DNI factual series nowadays? Absolutely realistic. Um, I have to say that I see it as our responsibility to work with as many new indies as possible. Um, my very first commission at Discovery was with was the first ever commission for an indie called Knickerbocker Glory that was set up by Jonathan Stadlin. That was Jodie Marsh Bodybuilding. Um, we've continued to commission shows from him, and the Jodie Marsh series has gone from strength to strength. Um, there's a clip later on that I'll show that was the very first commission ever for a startup called Rumpus, um, who are part of the Greenbird Group. Um, they'd never done anything before. It's one of the, one of the, the shows I've enjoyed commissioning the most this year. It's beautifully made. Um, it did very well for us. So I think, you know, it's all about the idea. It's not about who you're affiliated with or what group you belong to. Or how small you are. Yeah. You, you can, you will tr there's a question there about trust. You trust them. E every... They don't, but they don't need a massive track record if, they, if the idea is good and you think they can produce it. If the idea is right, we all know it's all about the, the showrunner or series producer anyway, right? So yeah. <laughs> provided you bring in the right, right. team, I think there's, there's no question that I'd work with any company. Uh, and I just want to go back to you, Liz, because you, you touched upon it. You've talked about you know, the, 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 the size of the regions, but it's also where, where you're all based. There's only six of you all together globally, yeah. isn't it? So there's, there's you two. There's another Sarah in Maryland. We've got John Seacrest in New York. Yeah. Kayla in Miami and Vikram based in Singapore. So that means yeah. one third, you two, one third of the commissioning team are based in the UK. It's, it's really about being a go-to person for producers. So we, we, we commission um, DNI content and local content and there is a go-to person regionally for producers so that we can, we can be a, a very clear face for people and that's, that's very important. So, I mean, just... Picking up on Sarah's point, in terms of the size of people that we work with, um, extreme car hoarders that I know um, we're um, coming to, that, that is a small independent nerd yeah. television. Uh, Jago Lee and John Farr and I brainstormed the idea and came up with extreme car hoarders, which is indeed a, a global um, phenomenon and, and smash it, including in the US. So we will support where we can. I don't know if it's worth going to extreme car hoarders before I talk nope, about the tone I'm, of it, actually. Let, let's just get it yeah. up there. But this is, let me, let me explain, this is mm. in the, the category you will probably have seen in other sessions of the, we uh, ask uh, commissioners and controllers, the, what was I thinking? <laughs> but we'll, well, we'll see it first and then I'll ask you what you, were, what you were thinking. This is extreme car hoarders. So this is in the what was I thinking category, but that was a hit, wasn't it? It is a hit. Yes, I think the, the, key, the key point about extreme car hoarders is um, it, it, it's really interesting because we started to look also in a lot of detail about what, what men want on the channel. And absolutely, we want to retain our heartland male viewers of the very traditional problem solving in terms of the physical and mechanical problem solving. That's very much at the heart of, of discovery. But we wanted to bring some female tones in as well and, and, and be inspired by some of the more uh, traditionally female areas. So we started to brainstorm this and we realized that as well as the idea of physically um, uh, clearing up a car hoard um, and uh, turning that profit into um, restoring one car, that there's a story of redemption with the, um, with the hoarders. And the reason I, I say what was I thinking is that it's one thing, I mean, I, I love things like the hoarder next door, but it's one thing sort of clearing up a box of thimbles from someone's front bedroom, <laughs> and it's another thing clearing up an entire hoard of cars um, and then customising one of them. So there were both practical issues, but also a real duty of care to the people who are prepared to let go of their cars that they've been holding on for many, many years. So those combination of tones of... Um, hardcore male car porn and uh, female problem solving was a very interesting combination that we did not know whether it would be a success. Okay, well, you've given me such a, a comprehensive explanation of your thinking that I'm going to let you off. I was going to pull you up for the, the what was I thinking category is more, oh, what was I thinking that I commissioned that? Yours is, this was my thinking. Well, what, you know, it, it, it's interesting because risks have to be taken in so many ways mm. and um, it is true that uh, uh, in another um, with another producer I was pushing into the female shiny floor area um, for factual specialist factual um, content and created a kind of shiny floor game show type feel to traditionally specialist factual did you um, wear it? Uh, and, and, it, and, it, and it didn't do well and so what, what um, was it called? 
Uh, I, mean, I, I, won't, you don't I, want, okay. I don't want to say simply for the production company, sure. actually, really, more than me, but uh, I pushed them in that direction, and they did a, a, a very good job. But in terms of trying to push the boundaries, extreme car holders worked, others don't. So again, we're trying to find risk in lots of different ways. Yeah. I mean, Lee, it all just goes to show that, I mean, just in terms of, you know, what is a hit and what isn't, you, you still can't tell. You can't. Any, <coughs> anything can come along. You, if, if I get asked that question, particularly of people that, that aren't in our business, is it's, well, why don't you just produce hits? <laughs> and there's, I mean, I get asked that question, and it's like, I don't even know, I don't even know how to answer it um, anymore. It's, you can, you can um, test it, you can, you know, change the, in the edit bay, you can change it 16, 17 times, everybody loves it. It's the highest testing show you've ever had. The intent to view is 100%, you put it on the air, and it bombs. You can have another one that tests horribly, you put it on the air, it's your next hit. We have one like that, one was called Alaska The Last Frontier, um, which is now in its fourth season, and six episodes were originally produced. The commissioner just didn't like it, so we took the six episodes, we put it together for three, just put it on our air, in the, initially in the, in the US, and bingo. Four years later, it's a hit. I can't tell you why. And still can't. Well, I think everyone in this room knows, knows the feeling. Let's continue with this then, male, female, factual approach, the evolution of it, because it, it's fascinating. And uh, Sarah, you brought along your, uh, what was I thinking, and you've stayed well, true, started... to the, true to the, uh, uh, the, the original meaning of, of the phrase. What I have you got? I start to think I'd misinterpreted it after I've been to a few control <laughs> sessions this week. Um, so this, this is actually a show called Your Soul in His Hands. It did really well for us. We, we had two series of it. Um, it. It was hosted by Lisa Snowden, who actually launched TLC UK. So uh, while I, while I, it was an absolute what was I thinking moment, and I think for me it was emblematic of a real turning point in my commissioning strategy. OK, well, let's see it, it and then tell us why it was a turning what? point. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, why? Why was it a turning point? I mean, do you think that that was over the line? Sexist. Do you know, the night that TLC launched in the UK, my boyfriend, uh, I got home and my boyfriend said to me, that show, that one, it's really chauvinistic. And do you know, I just hadn't thought about it. Um, and I know we'd struggled with it in the edit to try and tonally make sure that it was a balanced show. I think ultimately what, it, what clicked for me at that moment was I was making massive assumptions about what women wanted to watch mm. and, and I wasn't necessarily right. I needed to open my mind and really think about what it is that drives women. And so that's where we kind of, we ended up with, uh, with a phrase that we, we throw around a lot now, which is female factual. And, and the sort of, the reasoning behind that is that, you know, when I joined, I was called the lifestyle department. And I think, you know, for some reason, we place value on things by calling them factual. So we place value on learning how a, an, a radiator works, and we call it factual. But learning how people tick and human behavior for some reason, we call that lifestyle or features. It's sort of like we have to create a euphemism for female factual content, um, a bit like saying the painters are in when you've got your periods. And, and, and for me, I sort of started to feel like I needed to rebel against that and really question what it was that I wanted to make for women. So you two are starting to blur the lines. I mean, the, 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 the doors presumably have to be open between you and the discussions have to take place on a more regular basis than they did in the past. I think is that um, I am commissioning for um, predominantly the Discovery Channel. So at heart, it's male with female tones. And I don't want to speak for Sarah, but it's yours is the lifestyle channels and it's female with mm. some male tones. But, I mean, but it's you know, a the wonderful, point is, the interesting point is, sweet you know, spot. As, you, as you both take on yeah. board where you're coming from, yeah. and you, you move ever so slightly closer, eventually aren't you going to be commissioning programmes that could run on each other's channels? I would actually say it's key to keep the door nice. open. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the key thing is, is we're constantly trying to reinvent how we see our key genres, whether it be um, for pop science or, or engineering or turbo or adventure endurance uh, for medical. But the key thing is, is how to mix and match those. Mm. So although I sometimes set out a brief, Sarah sets out a brief, what we also say is, what's exciting you? What's new to the table? What's on YouTube? What's happening that we can 
put in the pot and stir. And that's a really, really important approach. So we're very happy to throw so, everything so up in the air. Thought you're doing quite well without a channel controller at the moment as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we it's, miss it's, him. It's yeah. the Lovely to <laughs> it's, it's business as usual for producers, and that's very important. We're, we're continuing okay. very much to commission and welcoming to, ideas. To clarify, what I'm not looking for is women in the jungle eating rats. Um, at, the, at the moment, okay, you well, know, I, I, think, ITV, yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, we are still after the classic female territories. We're after um, the health space. We're after fact and uh, character driven uh, uh, ensemble cast shows that really get at human behavior and why we interact with people the way that we do. Mm. Um, we're not quite at the point of rats, but, you know, we might get there eventually. But, but Lee, I mean, this sounds like it's evolving. You know, I would have imagined that this would have been a tablet of stone handed down after you and the, the head honchos had met in some shiny building in Los Angeles. We right? can't, this is the way we're going. We can't mandate anything. <laughs> you know, that's just not, that's just not how, how it works. And, and, and also, um, if you look at the Discovery Channel in the UK and then you're on a trip and you go look at the Discovery Channel in Poland, for example, they don't look the same. There may be some programming that crosses over, but you could find a health program created by Sarah on the Discovery Channel in Hong Kong, for example, because that market likes that kind of programming. I, th I think there's another really interesting thing about how we approach co-viewing as well. So, for example, um, we have a new talent with Bruce Crompton, um, who is a military vehicles picker and restorer. Now, what's interesting about the way we approach that is as well as the big tanks that he goes out, uh, out to pick, we make sure we have what I term a shop window of memorabilia as well, because it's like uh, if I'm going into a shop, I want to see lots of little bits at the front of the shop rather than the big um, stuff at the back as well. And so we found that that kind of antiques roadshow approach brings in co-viewing as well. So there are lots of different ways we're looking at things, not predominantly male, not predominantly feeling, but all, uh, female, but also where that co-viewing spot is in the middle as okay, well. Okay, I'm just uh, looking at the questions. This one's getting a, a lot of likes. Um, and it's, it's on the commissioning, it's on the size, and uh, it's on the on the reward and uh, where does it go? If you get a commission, the question goes, if you get a commission in the United Kingdom that gets picked up for other discovery territories, so if it gets picked up in Poland and beyond, is that really lucrative for the production company? How do you slice the cake? <clears throat> that, that depends. There are different ways um, in which we, we reward producers. Um, I have a, a personal philosophy that um, you take the risk with me in the beginning and if the series works, you deserve, a, you deserve part of the reward. That's just kind of how we try and operate our business affairs. Um, and there are different types of, of incentives that are given. There's profit participation. Sometimes there's bonuses for the, for the shows where they're, um, where they're sold. Um, and then the advantage, of course, to the producer, the non-monetary advantage to the producer, is that their show is seen in 200 countries. So there is an understanding, and our, our terms of trade, um, I, I think it's fair to say, are better now than they were three or four years ago. What was wrong in the past? We just took everything and told you to go <laughs> away. You know, We don't do that anymore. Okay. Well, you just take most. You just leave, most. Leave them on bus fare <laughs> home. Yeah, OK. Um, let's get some more clips out, because you, you bought plenty with us. And uh, this is... Um, in the riskiest program category. It's uh, one of yours, Liz. Would you like to introduce it? In fact, this is one of my colleagues, Sarah Davis, who is a commissioner uh, based in the US. Um, and this is uh, Manhunt, Manhunt, which um, Sarah has just announced as um, being recommissioned. So what's the risk, Liz, that he's caught in the first 10 minutes? And you've got so, well, well, actually, it's, it's absolutely the case. So, I mean, this is a, a terrific format from my colleague, Sarah Davis. Um, and what's interesting about it is, not, is, first of all, it's breaking new talent, which is great, Joel Lambert, um, an ex-Navy uh, SEAL. But it's true, it's sort of, it's the ultimate male fantasy of, oh, I wonder whether I could beat all these, um, I don't know why I'm doing that laddish voice, by the way. Um, I wonder whether I can, all, all these sort of, you know, <laughs> search and rescue teams, I wonder whether I can um, evade them um, around the world. And again, those are the local touch points that we, we bring in to make sure that um, countries around the world have 
uh, a local touch point of different um, tracking teams. But you're right, the risk often is about how dangerous can something be, and indeed it is dangerous for Joel, um, obviously within the bounds of health and safety. Um, but um, alongside that, it's, this is a real narrative unfolding. So he might get caught, he might not get caught. So Sarah talked to me about how she um, wanted to make sure that the end jeopardy of whether Joel was caught wasn't necessarily the biggest jeopardy. It's about Joel's problem solving along the way, but also being prepared to show the mistakes he makes, but then readdress those. So those are some of the ways we're looking at risk. Mm. There must be yeah. lots of problems. I mean, I don't want to go on about it too long, but just filming it, how do you, how do you set up? I mean, he's presumably yeah. got free reign within the parameters of where he is to go where he likes. Yes, I mean, uh, he has, he has a, a 12 hour head start on the, um, you know, the experts, um, and he has a crew, uh, you know, a small crew following him. Yeah. And, and that's very nice as well, because there's a very visceral feel to how that's filmed, because he'll be saying, come on, come, on down, come down here to the, to the crew. Um, but um, the, the key thing is, he, he is really exhausted, he's really dehydrated, he has a very small um, toolkit um, and kit bag with him, and he has to find ways of evading. But we make sure, or Sarah and, and, and her team make sure that um, there are there's enough problem solving and success and failure along the way um, to ensure that there are these genuine narratives of factual takeout, no matter what the outcome is. So Sarah, what does risk like for, look like from your perspective? Do you know, risk is a funny word, isn't it? It's yeah. sort of become the most overused word in television, yeah. I well, think. Well, it's seen as you really, really must take risks until you've got a turkey and then you shouldn't have made it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, everything's a risk and nothing's a risk. I don't think anyone goes out and commissions something thinking this is going to be a total failure. If we did, we'd yeah. probably be out of a job quite quickly. <laughs> but I think at the same time, um, you know, uh, I sit here under the banner of Discovery, and yet I work on a channel called T that's predominantly called TLC. In the UK, we're just over a year old, and so we have to try pretty hard to get noticed, not just um, by the viewers, but even in the building. You know, Jodie Marsh is now up on the wall amongst uh, Stephen Hawking and Bear Grylls, and they're big moments for us, and I think we, we fight that battle with viewers as well. You know, um, we have to make sure that we get heard, and... Um, a lot of that is through identifying talent that will get talked about. And I think often we're really prepared to take a risk on talent. OK, that's interesting. You defined it for us. Well, let's just have a look at your clip. It's the uh, Charlotte Crosby experience. Well, you know what, Sarah, you may be, you know, having, having seen that clip, I haven't seen these clips before, you may be interested in a little bit of audience research from my house with, the, you know, two teenage, <laughs> two teenage girls. I've actually seen that with them. I didn't know TLC made them, because you know the way they watch yeah. this stuff. Came off the planner, and I was sitting there watching it going, oh, my God. Well, you know, as, as fathers do. But, you know, <laughs> it, you know uh, so that's a 15-year-old and a 17-year-old. So yeah. are you pleased about that? I'm oh, very yeah, pleased. Okay, well, if anyone's tell, watching, tell I'm always yeah, pleased. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Charlotte Cosby, we commissioned about six months into the lifespan of TLC UK. Um, we'd previously had hits with our Jodie Marsh documentaries, which we, we've now turned into series that are coming back. Um, we'd also had hits, uh, a hit with a, a documentary following Tina Malone, who was pregnant at 50. All of this, I think, feeding into our kind of female factual uh, strategy. Um, I guess this felt risky because she doesn't feel like she's in our sweet spot. Our average mm. viewer's age is 39. We are 40% ABC One women here in the UK. Uh, I don't think anyone would claim that in any way Charlotte fits into any of that. Um, she'd been offensive on television before, you know, she'd pissed the bed on Geordie Shaw and Big Brother. I think um, she's not that known, she's young, yeah. she'd never done a show on her own before, but I love her. I think she's really funny. I think she embodies the spirit of what we're trying to do. She's curious about the world. Um, and so, I, and I think everyone at the channel agreed with me. So we, we decided to take a punt on her. We also then decided to make the show without any voiceover teasers or recaps or retrospective interviews and make it quite a kind of uh, prosaic watch, um, which I think made it feel quite different to anything else. There's a lot of other travel logs. This felt like quite a unique travel log. But I think for me, the key there was taking a risk on talent. And I think, I don't know if anyone's read The Sun this morning, but we've also got... Um, a show coming out with some more risky talent, Katie Hopkins, uh, working title, Katie Hopkins Gets Stuffed. And again, for okay. me, I think, you know, we've got to, we've got to make a lot of noise. We're a she, she new channel. Does. We're trying to commission in a slightly new space for women that I think is underserved. And so everything we do has to 
talk in a very loud voice. Okay, well, that's... I just wanted to put this from the app to you, but you, you're beginning to answer that. <laughs> uh, what are the commissioning opportunities? Very direct question on, on TLC. But judging from what you're saying, are you all commissioned out? Or are you still looking? Oh, no. So what are the opportunities? Um, so uh, when I commission, I put on a hat and worry about whether something's going to fit on TLC UK or for TLC internationally. But I don't think anyone else should worry about that. Um, we are actively seeking new ideas in the health and parenting space. Um, I think for me with parenting, uh, it's similar to health in that I want to really reinvent and own it. I think that we've done that with health. I don't think anyone's done that with parenting, and I think now's the time. So it's not about a direct transformation, bring in a talent, fix people in two days format. I think I really want to think about how we approach parenting on television. Okay. I've just got another interesting one in, uh, and, and, it's, uh, and it's been liked as well um, on the app. I like this, given what we've been talking about, the, the male-female split. And this is to you, Sarah, again. When we talk about parenting shows, it tends to be led by mums. Of course it does. Would, you, would your audience watch, and I'm going to add in, would you commission a dad talking about family issues? Without question. In fact, I think the next thing that I'm really keen to do is find more male, con male talent for our channel. I think, for me, I wanted to play with um, age, which is why we went with um, Charlotte Crosby and sort of demographic. But I, I, I think it's really important that we look for uh, people that cover off all of the people that aren't just our viewers, but the people in our viewers' lives. I don't, I don't kind of want to stop at women who were 39. That's not the only people we're going to represent on our channel. I mean, I'm interested in the lives of people who aren't you know, a 35-year-old TV okay. executive. Okay, and, 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 you know, flipping that round, that goes yeah. for you as well, doesn't it, Liz, in yeah, terms I of mean, who you would want to put on, on Discovery yes. and, and what, what they want yes. to say. Yes, With, without doubt. And um, the, a huge push, push to celebrate diversity in every way, whether it be on-screen production companies, uh, more f uh, women scientists for uh, particularly some of our pop science shows. Uh, for example, You Have Been Warned um, uh, and the uh, uh, countdown shows like that uh, from October Films. Um, so that we're really increasing um, a different mix of faces on the channel. Okay. We're running out of time. So uh, no, these questions are great coming in on the app. Thank you very much indeed for them. Uh, Lee, is Discovery looking at more indie acquisitions? obvious question. What are the benefits from acquiring UK indies rather than in other territories? That's the question. Um, actually, that's a, that's a very good question because um, the, way, the, way that, the way that I'm looking at it, the way that I'm looking at it now is if you take a look at some of our re recent acquisitions, which are free-to-air channels in uh, Italy and free-to-air channels in um, the Nordics, um, and these, you know, these these are the equivalent, the, particularly the Nordic ones, are the equivalent of ITV or something. I mean, they're they're big, okay. they're big they're big channels, and um, it's where it would be helpful for the growth of that channel to have not just to, to have a closer relationship with a production company that understands the DNA of the networks that happen to be in that, um, in that area, um, we would be looking at something like that. I mean, that to me personally is, is, is very interesting. Because that's a natural fit. It's okay. a natural fit But you're not going to be discovery. buying a free-to-air broadcaster in the UK, or maybe, I don't know, you're going to have no, a pop well, at not, ITV? Nobody's told me about no. that. I already okay. worked at ITV. But what about the indies then in the UK? Um, it depends on, on, on what the indie has. So um, if, if an indie is, is very well known for um, Shiny Floor, well, we don't put Shiny Floor on our air. So, I, I tried and failed. I know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> good, at least you tried. Uh, so why would I be interested in, in a company um, that doesn't have any programming for, for discovery. It goes back to, to the original point of, of the acquisitions, and that is to be able to be closer to the talent, uh, both on screen and off, uh, behind the camera and in front of the camera, um, that's relevant to us rather than somebody else. That's kind of the, of the starting point. And we've bought enough now that, pretty, particularly in the UK, any company that comes up for sale somehow somebody calls to see whether or not we're interested. Okay, listen, I just want to say, uh, I mentioned we are running out of time, so if you've got any verbal questions you want to, to put to uh, anyone on the panel here, put your hand up now and we'll get a microphone to you and we'll, um, and we'll uh, 
put them there. All right, we've got two. So we can have the gentleman in the front. We'll get the microphone. There's a, a gentleman uh, towards the back as well there. If we could get a mic in your hand as well so as you can come straight in afterwards. So if you could, as we always do, identify yourself, please. So it's uh, Daniel Tool. I run uh, IBM's Mutual Entertainment business across Europe. But this is a question from an old life. Liz, you may, you may remember. Um, so, so if I look at Discovery's content overall, um, you've kind of moved the genre quite a lot. So you're sort of blending factual and reality and you're doing all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, in the sort of original vein of Animal Planet type stuff, is there still a space for very big scale, very high production value, you know, completely new uh, um, uh, traditional natural history stuff that tends typically in the past to have gone out on BBC and more recently has gone out on Sky? And um, it's a very key question, good question. as well as the character-led, long-running returnable, um, and as well as the format process-driven play-along formats. Um, and I did mean to mention that we are open for business for new ideas for 2016 for those. Yes, absolutely, we're looking for specials. And that can range from anything from fast turnaround news reactive, where we look at the news and analyze the news in more detail, to blue chip traditional, to live events. So yes, indeed, that space is, we're open for business there too. Good to know. Uh, we had a question uh, back up there, yes. Hello, Andrew from Cloud9 Management. Um, if you could build your own perfect on-screen piece of talent, what would they look like? <laughs> okay, Sarah, Sarah, first of all. Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> oh, John Malone, right, okay. Yeah. I think he might cost you too much. Um, Sarah. Do you know, um, I wouldn't be able to describe how they look, but I think, for me, what's really important is that they are incredibly outspoken, that, that everything they say is said with conviction, and that they're willing to put their, 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 their bodies or their convictions to the utmost test. Um, I think uh, for anyone to work for a TRC viewer, they have to be absolutely unfiltered. There must be humor in, in the way they approach the world, but they have to kind of, they have to, they shouldn't be there because they're famous. They should be there because what they're doing is something they're genuinely passionate about. And as discussed before, they can be any gender. Well, I think, you know, they, they could be men, they could be women. I don't think they have to look a particular way. I think Katie Hopkins is a really important example for me of that. Um, whether or not I agree with some of her political views, she's absolutely convicted in, in what she says. And I think she, um, what she's doing for us is very bold. She's uh, putting her body genuinely on the line to test her own theory about weight. And, uh, and for me, that's a pretty extraordinary, audacious thing to do. So is that what she's going to do? She's what? She's going to gorge herself and then starve herself? Or she's gaining between three and four stone, right. and then she's going to lose the weight. I mean, I wouldn't want to do it. I applaud her. I take my hat off to her. She's pretty bloody ballsy. Your, your ideal talent? My ideal talent is very much epic and every man. So it's about um, those um, epic aspirational values that someone has, but they're very relatable. So those are the key, the key di dichotomy. In terms of who I, uh, who I uh, think embodies that, I suppose, I mean, many of our talents have different degrees of it, but if you look at someone like Chuck Colombo in Extreme Car Hoarders, he is um, both sort of epic in stature and ambition, but also he cries as well. <laughs> okay, listen, we're nearly out of time. We, we, we've got a last clip to go out on the uh, upcoming thing I'm very excited about seeing. But um, we've got a, a question here. This will be to you, Lee. It's more about acquisitions, this time about rights. Does Eurosport have any plans to move into mainstream sports rights in the United Kingdom? They're very expensive. They're very sought after. Oh. <laughs> you do. I'm just trying to decide whether I should answer the question. Okay. Well, you've answered it. <laughs> um, Great I, question. I think, Thank I, you. I think that they, I think I truly believe that the answer to that question is I don't know at this point in time, because the acquisition just closed. It's less than three months old, um, and it's going to take some time for us to come up with a strategy. I would be surprised to see, you know. Pro, to see sports programming that costs billions of dollars to, to acquire um, on a cable network as opposed to on a broadcast network. So not football? Uh, I couldn't. It would just be very difficult for, for me to see because you won't get the audience. You won't be able to um, uh, monetize it. 
properly to, to be able to amortize the cost of, of uh, those rights. I mean, they get so expensive now in the UK that you see ITV and BBC splitting the cost. Hmm. So, but um, not, with, not with football. I mean, you know, football's on, on Which satellite. football? Football. Oh, our football. Your football. Soccer. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I, I just, it. I, it's, too, it's too soon to be able to answer the question. Okay, well, well, thank you for doing as much as you could do. I mean, you've been very frank through, uh, throughout um, the session. We're going to wind it up now, but first of all, let's uh, say our thanks to Liz, Lee, and Sarah. Very good to see you. Thank you very much, Lee, from Discovery Networks International. And um, we will, who, who's commissioned this one? I actually don't know. Secret Eskimo Escape. Just, uh, so this, is, just you, this is from the uh, Factual Entertainment Slate. It was commissioned by my colleague, John Seacrest, who's based in New York. Um, and uh, I've brought this one along because I think it's about how we're pushing forward into slightly different program shapes. Um, it's an ensemble cast reality show, but it's one that we feel really works for us because it's based around a subculture. And we, we often talk about wanting to find subcultures for TLC. And, and people say, well, they've all been done. Um, but I think in this instance, we sort of found a group of people who genuinely feel like they open a window onto a world that I didn't expect to see. And they were right under everyone's nose. So I guess I would say, don't assume that a subculture is what you think it is. It's a group of people who just see the world with a different perspective. And that's really what we want you to bring us. Okay, well, thanks and good night. Uh, let's have a look. <laughs> Just before we go, I've got to say thank you to Broadcast for sponsoring it. Louise Blythe from the BBC Academy for producing this. And uh, thanks to anyone else who've had anything to do with it. Uh, just give them a quick round of applause as well. Thank you. And bye.